and a special welcome to Professor Krishnamenon and Professor Rajiv Bhargava, who are here to share with us their thoughts on some of the current issues on conserving the past, and to Sushila Ravindranath, who will moderate today's discussion. In fact, the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage was founded in 1984, 36 years ago, as a non-profit organization for preserving India's vast and unprotected cultural heritage that consists of built heritage, natural heritage, and intangible heritage. Today, INTAC is considered as one of the largest heritage organizations both in India and the world, and we have 212 chapters across the country. In Chennai chapter, we've been having programs and initiatives that have done their bit to preserving heritage as well as to promote heritage awareness. So uh, recently, we've had these online programs. We've had uh, uh, you know, an expert from the UK joining us to tell us about injecting life into existing buildings. And then we had a panel discussion with uh, Leo Saldana and Surit Patsarthi a couple of weeks ago on the EIA draft notification. And uh, most recently, we had a talk on sacred plants by Dr. Nandita Krishna. We have lined up a few more programs in the coming weeks, and we uh, welcome all of you to join us for those. Just a few announcements. Uh, these forthcoming programs will be on Instagram and the Facebook page of Intact Chennai Chapter. Those of you who would like to get in touch with us, please mail at intactchennai at gmail.com. This uh, ID I will also type onto the chat box. And uh, today's and future programs can be watched live on YouTube on our Intact Chennai Chapter channel. So if any of your friends are joining in late are not able to access this platform, please let them know that they can watch it live on the YouTube channel. I request all of you to please stay muted right through the program just to make sure there's no you know, to minimize audio disturbance. This discussion is to help the state and citizens to get a better understanding of short-term and long-term implications of often contradictory and conflicting points of view. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two eminent speakers. Professor A.G.K. Menon is an architect and urban planner practicing in Delhi since 1972. As a founding member of INTAC, he has carried out pioneering urban conservation works around the country and contributed to defining the theoretical and professional parameters of discipline in the Indian context. Professor Menon drafted the Charter for the Conservation of Architectural Heritage and Sites in India in 2004. He has been actively involved in education and co-founded the TVB School of Habitat Studies in 1990. He continues to contribute professionally through critical writing and activism to promote public good. Professor Rajiv Bhargava retired as professor at Center for Study of Developing Societies, CSDS, Delhi, and currently is an honorary fellow and director of the Center's Institute of Indian Thought. He's been a professor at the Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and was also head Department of Political Science, the University of Delhi. He is an honorary fellow, Balliol College, Oxford. Professor Bhargava was one of the principal consultants for the UNDP report on cultural liberty. He writes a fortnightly column for the Hindu. His work on secularism and methodological individualism is internationally acclaimed. He is currently working on religious and philosophical pluralism in ancient Indian thought. 
So may I request Professor Menon to start off the discussion? Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I think you've laid on a huge agenda. And so I begin by limiting that agenda because obviously we can't discuss everything about uh, the problems of conservation in India. We're only focusing on one particular issue that has been uh, uh, in the public domain recently, which is if the past is reinterpreted, how does it impact the conservation of the monuments, which are already being conserved? So reevaluating the future of the past in the light of contemporary interpretations of history. Uh, I think I would like to sort of uh, uh, contextualize that by saying that uh, we have to look at how we conserve in India. What are the rules that we follow? What are the practices that we follow? Which is provoking us to question all this. Because if you're questioning a certain practice, what is that practice? So to begin with, we've got to be very clear that uh, our practices are really based on colonial uh, impositions, uh, colonial laws, colonial practices, told us how to conserve our monuments, which had been built from, by other traditions and other philosophical uh, uh, positions. So there is at once a certain uh, 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 conflict here that uh, we find that conservationists follow a certain principle which is universal, and the universal can be further clarified to say it's Eurocentric. So that Eurocentric uh, uh, philosophy is used to conserve Indian monuments. Now that obviously creates a problem with the local population, because the, while the conservators look at these monuments in a very objective, scientific way, and then wonder what how in, uh, history is interpreted and whether it should be done or not done, the local people look at it more empathetically. And that empathy is the difference between what has happened perhaps in the US and what we are talking about today, which I want to elaborate upon. If you empathize with a monument, you relate to it differently. You, uh, uh, you uh, want the, its future in a different way. If you don't empathize with it, you might want to destroy it. And that would be perfectly in order as far as the system is concerned. But if you look at it objectively as a historian, you cannot change the past. So you cannot change the monument that represents the past. So I think that I just want to lay it out that there, that conflict is there. And that conflict makes profound problems for conservation in India. Should the changing interpretations of events, whether it's good or bad, determine how monuments are conserved? So there are multiple views, and we are only going to be looking at the Indian context. We are not going to look at the American concept, con context or the, uh, uh, the British context, because that's what's come in the news. When we say that uh, monuments are being uh, destroyed in America and the US because of all this, it doesn't really concern today's debate. We are interested how it impacts our uh, uh, view, our, 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 the way we look at our monuments. So in a way, to begin, I would like to emphasize that this discussion will throw light on, shall we say, the foundational questions of how we conserve, why we conserve, what we conserve, and who decides what we conserve. So these are some of the questions that I hope to elaborate upon. And uh, so the ideology, as I said, is something that we've got to keep in mind. This ideology is based on colonial laws and after independence. They, get, they got absorbed, they got uh, accommodated in the international charters advocated by UNESCO, which are also largely uh, uh, Eurocentric. There have been attempts even by UNESCO to, to accommodate more uh, local views. For example, there's the Nara Charter of uh, uh, UNESCO, which accommodates the Japanese view. There is the Bara Charter of Australia that, that, uh, that accommodates the Aboriginal views of, of conservation, but there has been no such uh, attempt in India, except as uh, the uh, introduction mentioned that I did try and do a, a document an Indian charter. But that, that no, I think that Chennai charter is on. 
Hello, you okay? Fine. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Now there's a very interesting uh, example as far as Haji is concerned in India, and that is the archaeological survey India has begun to permit worship in mosques, protected mosques. For example, the Taj, Taj Mahal, they allow worship on Friday when the public is not allowed. Sorry, Pogi, no. there is still an echo. Okay. Okay. Still an echo. Hello. There's Can someone I... from in intact Chennai can rectify it. I think it's done, sir. We can continue. Okay, okay. So the example I want you to say in India is that we are permitting worship in mosques even if they're protected. This is interesting. If they're not being uh, uh, handed over to the uh, minority community, they're allowed to worship. So there's a small nuance there that. Uh, uh, unlike Babri Masjid, where it has been demolished, here uh, you're allowing worship and it continues as a tourist attraction. So, I just like to highlight that uh, as far as Hagia Sophia is concerned, the lessons that we can learn and uh, discuss. Then we come to the third example the redevelopment of uh, Central Vista, which is, of course, an ongoing uh, issue and it has many of the uh, larger issues conflated in it. Uh, what to conserve, how do you conserve it, who conserves it, who decides. For example, the redevelopment of, uh, of uh, uh, Central Vista is the dream of the leader. And we are spending 20,000 crores to uh, fulfill that dream. Did the conservationists think of uh, uh, redeveloping the Central Vista? Because I say that because it is a grade one heritage precinct, according to the law, according to the master plan of Delhi, it is a grade one structure. And yet, we have no say, the conservations have no say on how it is to be conserved and what should be done in future. In fact, the government is not even consulting the people, let alone uh, experts. They've appointed an architect who then decides what to do, and they're saying we're conserving the place. How are we conserving the place? We're keeping the shell of the building and making it a museum, which is a perfectly functioning building. Uh, North Block, South Block, ministries, parliament building, the parliament of India. And it's all going to be turned into shells. And they claim it is conservation. We're conserving. What are you complaining about? Or take the central vista, for example. They say, yes, what are people complaining about? The trees are there. The, uh, the vista is there. The ponds are there. Uh, is central vista is still there. But devoid of the spirit of the place. Here was a public place, which is now going to be converted into a gated government office area. And we know it's going to be gated because if you, you, if you go to the North Block, South Block, you're not allowed to go there freely because the ministries are there, the barriers and uh, police barriers, and you can go there to take selfies. And that's what's going to happen to Central Vista and they're claiming that they're conserving this place by uh, uh, doing it. So there are enormous problems. But what is it that we conserve in a uh, place like Central Vista? It is a conflicted history, of course. It's a colonial and imperial capital, which is now the capital of a democratic republic. And we have owned it. As India, we owned it. We are proud of it. On January 26th, we have our parades there. So it is not as though that we are ashamed of it. We're extremely proud of it. And yet, we want to modify it on what grounds? What are the grounds? Are we consulting experts? In fact, the irony is, you talk to the government, they say, oh, we will do a heritage impact assessment. We will do an environment impact assessment after the project is done, after, or after the project is designed. Completely upending everything. And the other interesting thing they say is that we're following the laws. How are they following the laws? They're changing the laws. The master plan is changed. So whether it's a grade one monument, 
Now the master plan allows it to happen. It allows it to happen. So we are following the laws. Or the, uh, the Delhi Urban Arts Commission permits it. Or the Environment Impact Assessment Committee permits it. So we are following the laws. So you see the whole, shall we say, the charade of uh, conservation. And why did the charade uh, uh, happen? Because as I told you right in the beginning, the laws are colonial. It has colonial uh, implications. It has colonial objectives. And it's only now that the brown sahibs have taken over the colonial imperatives and deciding what, how the Indian monument should be conserved. So the Black Lives Matter, Hagia Sophia, and the redevelopment uh, uh, of the Central Vista are an opportunity for us, conservationists, professional, other professionals, and society to reflect how is it that we want to look at our past and hand it over to a future generation. Uh, in fact, many uh, intelligent people say the Central Vista is an empty space. And so what is wrong with the government in uh, building these buildings? So you see how we, how we lost the plot. We lost the narrative. It's entirely now a development narrative. It is to be developed. And we also lost the narrative in the sense that people are now saying, oh, a leader is allowed to take a decision. Why he's taking a decision? Of course, he's take, allowed to take a decision. But there is a very fine line between deciding and how and what you decide on. What you decide on is determined by experts. Of course, the political leadership finally decides. Even in the UK, even in America, it is the political leadership that decides, not the conservationists. But the conservationist says what ought to be done. And the leader then decides accordingly. If you read, for example, the latest uh, town planning acts of UK, it says very clearly, the secretary environment will decide. There's no doubt about it. It's the secretary environment will decide. But based on the advice of the town planners and the professionals. Now, that is something that we can learn about the uh, uh, redevelopment of Central Vista. And the Central Vista is not only about heritage. It's about urban development in general. Urban development in general is now being done by administrators, politicians, developers, not by town planners, not by experts. So our cities are at the mercy of who decides. And who decides are not the experts, but the people in power. So with those three examples, these are the issues that I want to raise. The, in conclusion, all I'd like to say is that there's a very ironic joke that I want to recite, which is that you always said that if in the West, the conservationist catches a cold, the Indian conservator sneezes. And I'm afraid this is what is happening here. Uh, in the West, they are going, uh, they are having a cold because, you know, the Black Lives Matter and Hagia Sophia and all this is happening, and we are sneezing. Now, the purpose of my discussion today here is to point out that you know, we have no reason to catch a cold because they got a cold. We have our own problems, we have our own maladies, we have our own COVIDs, we've got our own uh, uh, problems. Let us try and solve our problems ourselves. One of the things in the conservation movement that's coming is that because we cannot solve our problems, let us get international people to help us. In Red, uh, Central Vista, for example, they're saying, let us get the international community to come and protest. And I said, look, I protest. This is our problem. We have got to sort it out. This is what happened 200 years ago. 200 years ago, one Raja having a fight with another Raja couldn't decide amongst themselves. So they invite a third person, the East India Company, to come and help them. And lo and behold, 200 years later, we are taken over. So that may not happen here today in 2020. We may not be taken over by the international community, but our minds will be taken over. Our processes will be taken over. Our objectives will be taken over. And we will not be our own agents to determine how we should conserve, what we should conserve, and who do we conserve for. So those are some of the points I wanted to make uh, for open up for discussion. Thank you very much. Sushila, would you like to take over? Unmute.
mute yourself, Sushi. Okay, now? That's fine. So, may I now invite uh, Professor Bhagavad to give his point of view. How do we look at all these things from an ethical point of view? There are so many conflicting, contradictory opinions which can arise out of uh, uh, these um, points of view which have been raised. So, I'm, now I invite uh, Professor Bhagavad to come in. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Menon for uh, his remarks, and uh, I'm sort of provoked uh, to actually not look at the specific issues in detail. The, I will talk about those issues, but those as examples uh, that fit a more general framework that I will provide. That's my training, and that's but I do take seriously the four foundational questions uh, that have been raised by uh, uh, Mr. Ravindra and uh, by which are, which are what is to conserve, must we conserve, which is actually related to the other question, what is it that we do not want to conserve? The second, of course, is why do we have to conserve? For what? Justification to we offer for conservation, and the third, of course, is how do we preserve? How, how do we conserve? Which are the forms? Which are the which are the sites? In what form do we conserve? Whatever it is that we wish to conserve, and finally, the question: Who decides? So I'll try my to kind of a philosophical and ethical take each four questions. Uh, during the course of this presentation. So, uh, on the first question, what is to, I think the short answer uh, is uh, our heritage. It begs the question, what is heritage? It's certainly not everything that we have. All is in some select. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, in what constitutes heritage. Past that we want to live, that we want to live in. Uh, that we want to bring. To. So uh, that very, very much one important component of heritage. But the second component of heritage is what that we presently think is significant. So it is not just any. It's what we believe to be value past. Uh, what we believe is worth, is worth creating uh, and, and, uh, it, rather than what, whatever it is that we wish to forget, uh, whatever it is uh, not to uh, celebrate, uh, and so on. Uh, now, there are, of course, uh, there is, of course, one other uh, 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 area which is somewhere in between. There are lots of things that we want to remember only because we do not want them to happen again. We want to prevent them from happening again. When we go to, for example, uh, we don't just go there to... ...we assassinate it by one of his own countrymen. Uh, if you look at the Vietnam Memorial, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, two very extraordinary memorials, uh, these are monuments of public apology. They express regret. So, Reachment not to allow these things to happen again. So remembering itself is a little complicated. Uh, we don't want to forget everything. There are lots of things we want to forget, but things we want to not just to celebrate, but also uh, for other reasons. Okay, the second, of course, uh, the second important question is why? Why is it that we wish to uh, conserve and, and remember 
Uh, <clears throat> and here, I think a very simple answer, we have to be quick about these things. Uh, a very simple answer is the funds leads to our elective self. That it, in some ways, it is part of identity. It, it affirms our identity. It's part of our narrative, which comes with our elective and and fish of individual selves. It's a source, and I'm using but it's a source of, these are, these are things which, these are uh, uh, items which are source of pride. Uh, and now, there is no, there's never going to be an agreement on what it is that we find significant. There's always some uh, disagreement, there are always disputes, there are always conflicts, uh, because what is affirming, what is self-affirming um, is, is demeaning to others, uh, gives pride to some, actually is a, what gives comfort to some, what uh, makes people feel at home. Uh, that is precisely that which is also profound existing discomfort to uh, another at its own. So, A heritage for some people makes other people gives us a sense of strength to other people. It is uh, a source of exclusion to other people. Uh, in fact, some of this is deeply insulting and offensive uh, to others. Uh, so, heritage is untested. Uh, there is no way that we can avoid these conflicts, and particularly, not only that, us, but all deeply, uh, and gratify for for sense. So I would like uh, uh, then. So if we look at conflicted heritages. I would like to think that there are three forms of conflicts. One uh, conflicted, one kind of conflicted heritage uh, is uh, uh, there. I mean, the conflicts that surround heritage, uh, those conflicts are for inclusion on free and equal terms. Uh, heritage is part of that struggle, uh, a part of a struggle for freedom and equality. So there are many uh, symbols uh, iconic symbols, uh, many symbols that are that are symbols of, of oppression, to and uh, uh, I, I'm thinking of the statue of Cecil Rhodes, for example. There's a lot of controversy over that. Uh, uh, I already mentioned uh, there are all sorts of issues being raised in America by the Black Lives Movement. And uh, even in India, as I would, uh, I've come to that. So, so these are uh, some people who have been privileged and who derive uh, pleasure of whatever it is that has been a symbol of oppression. Uh, people are bound to be hurt. They will be there is a hurt to manufacture hurt. Uh, and and, and, and there are lots of other people, perhaps the majority of people, who will find that these symbols of oppression must go. Now, how it is going to go is another issue. That is uh, the question of how we conserve. But this is one very important uh, where uh, conflict over heritage takes place. Second is uh, as a result of structural recognition. When there is all marginalized, and it's for a space, an uh, inescapably public space, where it can also represent itself, where it can uh, manifest uh, its own, uh, uh, what, it, what it considers to be uh, its own symbols, its own identities, and, and here, uh, I would say, in the broader international context, what happens in Hagia Sophia and what happens, for example, in the Mesquita, 
cathedral in Cordoba, uh, and indeed what happened in India uh, uh, around Babi Masjid. Uh, all these are 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 are, are struggles uh, for either assertion uh, by or uh, in many cases it's a struggle for recognition by groups which have been defeated or which have been marginalized. And I think third source of conflict, and that source of conflict actually is an all uh, It combines, and there are many such instances where uh, you cannot say that this is one or the other, where cultural oppression itself is the issue. And, and heritage is part of this broader uh, struggle. So, uh, uh, question. Uh, who decides? And I think I'm pretty clear about it. I mean, this is uh, these issues which are we have a, a, a long of long lasting importance uh, to a whole people. These issues cannot be decided by. I think it cannot be decided even by an elected government. So this whole issue of central vista for me, uh, on simple ground, is a no, no. It just is is a a, 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 a real kind of a product. If any change there is a product of of uh, uh, illusions of grandeur uh, on the part of one person or it is something that is imposed by, a elect, by elect, elected duck, by an elected duck, which after all comes and goes, it's for five years, may be there for 10. But we are dealing with issues of heritage, which are much more, which have a long term. So I think, uh, uh, I think elected but which concerns everyone, and certainly uh, architects, artists, philosophers, historians, uh, all, and, and others, anybody who's interested, you know, alert, guardians of cultural memory, where they are. I mean, all of them have a stake in it, and all of them should be part of uh, this decision. Body. It cannot be uh, decided uh, a few people, and and to uh, protest uh, if uh, if it happens to be decided at the whim of a leader or by by elected government, no matter how uh, 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 how many uh, sort of votes uh, uh, that government uh, um, sort of uh, managed to get, I don't think there is uh, there is a there is a good justification. Uh, I think uh, there is uh, another. Uh, I think a very good example, which Professor uh, Menon mentioned, of uh, at least a broader a, a, a decision being taken after a broader consultation. It was inconclusive, but still, uh, uh, it, the, there was more consultation in the 1960s when it was decided that uh, while uh, George Fitz's uh, statue, which had been removed earlier, uh, uh, that should not be there. It took a long time I to have uh, to empty uh, a reminder that we are a republic and that we will not uh, rule by uh, one monarch or one dictator. I think that uh, leaving it empty is a very, very fine decision. I think uh, there was a proposal that Gandhi should have been put there, but it would be deeply uncomfortable for to have uh, somebody that done. With, a, with his staff facing the Raj, Raj, uh, uh, the Raj Pati Bhavan, uh, or uh, which was the former Viceroy of Arms, um, I think uh, to leave it empty was a very fine decision. And I think that decision came because uh, of the intention on the part of the government to actually have broader consultation. Uh, I would say that uh, there are certain considerations, which is statues of 
historical figures. There are some considerations which are uh, relevant and which must uh, taken into account. One is that a decision to preserve them or to, uh, uh, to remove them, that decision cannot be taken on that. Secondly, active passion should not be a decisive factor in whether you are removing them or preserving them. I'm not suggesting that feelings do not matter. Uh, Professor Menon talked about empathy. Of course, feelings matter, but feelings are not just physical perturbation. You, when you, when you, uh, fear, so you, when you have a fear, you have a fear about something. In fact, you can be having fear on extremely irrational grounds. All our feelings also in certain claims, claims which can be true or false or right or wrong, and this to be part of our uh, uh, the our, our consideration. But I said we, they can be decisive considerations. Uh, I also believe that narrow standards of political correctness cannot be the basis of what is to go and what is to stay. Statues cannot be dislodged on the basis of current uh, ideas of what is politically correct. Uh, I think this is a point fits in with the other point that I made, that we need a much larger consultative body, which may take a much longer time to arrive at some decision. But I, think, uh, I, I would sort of tend to emphasize this point that uh, of political correctness should not be allowed uh, to, to prevail. Uh, uh, so, so what should be the uh, main uh, criteria? I think, uh, I would say that uh, it should be, uh, we must rely on the complex adjustments which are based on a person's overall contribution to Election life. Uh, there is nobody who is who is perfect. Uh, there are all kinds of flaws, and some of these flaws are really uh, flaws that are true to people because there are general deficiencies in an entire era. Nobody is really free of them. I mean, I mentioned today in the column I wrote is you can take a patriarchy test. And you will find that all great figures will fail that test. Not uh, Karl Marx will not pass it. Ambedkar, our greatest Dalit icon, icon, pass it. Uh, Martin Luther King will not pass it. I mean, all these people had very flawed views of women, and they treated women in a in not a in an equal way. But that is not a reason. That alone cannot be a reason. Uh, to take their statues off. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, there are some people who would pass this. I think Mahatma Gandhi does pass this test, uh, and we can, uh, we can talk. But but uh, like Cecil Rhodes or Edward Wilson doesn't pass this. I mean, Rhodes uh, remained consistent. He he was a he was a racist. He was a colonialist. He believed in the in the supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon race, uh, and he did not uh, uh, give up these views uh, uh, he, to, till the end of his life. The case uh, So I, I would say that, uh, and finally, of course, I've been talking about uh, uh, statues or other symbols or other uh, features or elements of heritage are inescapably public. I mean, we, as, as, we, uh, as we've done in the case of uh, George the Fifth, boy, the put him in a coronation park. I think we can do that case of even people like Cecil Rhodes. I mean, they can be put in a mute, uh, uh, which is uh, on the history of slavery. And I would say that even uh, even when you have a statue of Gandhi, 
uh, maybe you should write a little text. Perfect. When there were some some things about which he was wrong, and, but I think there's no reason uh, to take the statues off uh, of uh, of inescapably public arenas. Uh, but there is a case for taking things away from these arenas. But uh, I'm just is something that I would. Uh, Say is is a is a last resort. I mean, if twenty years of struggle does not produce a response from uh, the powers, then I suppose they are left with no option but to do something like that. Uh, but if but I think at some point of time there is a uh, order. People should should all sit together and 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 and, and decide and. You're the best way to go. Okay, I'll I'll end there. Sushi, will you take over? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yes, so, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Menon, Professor Bhargava. You've thrown up, you've given us very interesting points to ponder upon, but we still have to decide who decides. So I want both of you to explain, in a democracy, what happens? Every leader, even if they are there only for five years, they want to leave some kind of monument for themselves, some figure, some building, and they're not bothered about uh, destroying them. So how do we deal with that situation? Professor Menon? Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. You know, I think uh, uh, Professor Bhargav has raised very important issues, which as conservation professionals, we normally don't consider, but they're absolutely important. But it raises the, uh, the answer to the question that you asked. Uh, how, do we, how do we accomplish all the uh, issues? How, how do we uh, solve all these problems? And I think here I'd like to stress the fact the object is not the, uh, the purpose, it's the process. If you follow a proper process, whatever the uh, results are, I think would be satisfactory. So quite often in conservation, we try and go for a perfect solution. And we compromise the process. This consultation is, when we say public discourse, when we say uh, negotiated decision making, all this takes time. All this requires a process. And no conservator is really taught how to go about it. They're taught the technical uh, factors of how to conserve an object. But the human angle, which is how do you deal with uh, morality, ethics, how to deal with social equity. These are all issues that have been raised by Professor Bhargav about conservation. And conservation cannot escape these, issues, these questions. And as conservators, as conservation professionals, we've got to see how to, uh, how to accommodate it. Now, either we have a team or we have a long process where we negotiate all these things and slowly over time, when we talk about the Black Lives Movement, it is not a one-week uh, immediate response. You know, when you say that it was a, 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 a response to political correctness, I sort of slightly disagree in the sense that it was 150 years of negotiation going on. Since, you know, 1865, this thing has been going, this uh, decision has been going on. And in 2020, they, and in 1960s, they had their, uh, their laws changed. And even then, 50 years later, all this has happened. So what I'd like to learn from that is that these kind of decisions are negotiated. The process is important. Everyone has to be accommodated. And this is the only way to do it. There's no correct answer. There's no one can say that this is the best way of doing things. It has to be uh, left to a process that evolves slowly and which as many people can be accommodated, should be accommodated. So that's the only answer I can give for that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I was misunderstood uh, uh, 
activism. And then I wasn't talking about the Black Lives Movement uh, when I was talking about political correctness. I had uh, the, the, the statues of Gandhi in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not the statues of uh, uh, slave owners. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the black issue is, I mean, slavery was abolished in the 1860s yeah. or even earlier. And there was a major civil war which took place. And yet, almost 100 years later, we still needed a civil rights movement. Uh, there, there were lots of setbacks uh, to the uh, act of uh, abolition of slavery. And these were not just the social setbacks, they were legal setbacks. All kinds of laws were made uh, to discourage people from abandoning slavery. So I think uh, I completely agree with you. That is a, a very different issue. Uh, you know, 200 years of colonialism. I mean, I mean, the, the, those are struggles that have been taking place for 100 years. I'm not surprised that statues come down the way they have come down now. But I'm talking about other, you know, when I was talking about uh, 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 overall consideration and uh, not going by political correctness, I mean, you know, if we look at many other statues, including the statue of Sheikh Gandhi, you'll, those are the issues that we have to face. So on the issue of who decides, I think I made it very clear that I'm, uh, now we, I don't know, we, maybe we are completely helpless, uh, maybe we don't have the, the voice, maybe we are living in a society and a political system which doesn't allow for any of, of what we want. But we should just, at least we can acknowledge it if we can't go out and protest. But the fact is that, as, as uh, uh, Professor Menon also pointed out, this has to be a long-term process. I mean, it, these are not issues. I can, you know, governments are there to make, uh, uh, to make policies and uh, to enact uh, laws uh, which are to do uh, with the with largely with the present and over which they actually need some consensus at least within the parliament right yeah. I mean uh, at least that the deliberation in the parliament going through the entire procedure at least that is something that they have to do but when it comes to Big issues like you know whether to conserve a monument or not, or whether to have a, a statue installed in in the uh, under the the canopy behind uh, or you know facing India Gate. I mean those are issues which will. I mean it would be odd if somebody is going to install a statue now and then some other person will come five years later and take that statue <laughs> out, uh, uh, and then a third one will be installed. I mean. That's not the way we, 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 we look at our monuments. I mean, statues are easy prey because they're smaller, but I mean, they should be seen uh, alongside monuments, which you cannot simply get rid of that easily. And I think the decisions that apply to monuments must also apply to the statues. Uh, yeah. Rajiv, you know, it's a serious issue, but if I can just crack a small joke here. The sure. Romans faced the same uh, problem. You know, leaders would come and go, and each leader wants to put a statue. So they invented a very interesting solution, which was the body was there, the head kept changing. A new leader uh -huh. came, they put a new head. But the statue yeah. remained in the public place. It was still there. And came, they changed the head. So, you know, solutions it can be found. The, uh, uh, near the parliament. Yes. So near the parliament, we should have uh, probably uh, something like uh, this Roman practice, yes. when we can have a statue which can keep changing all its, its heads. But I think it, Parliament, uh, somewhere near Parliament is, is fine, uh, but I think anywhere else, uh, I don't yeah. think, uh, I mean, where, where uh, we have to conserve is a very, very important question. I think that is a question that we have to really address that much. But where should uh, people who we look up to People who we think of as exemplars, people who we wish to celebrate, people who we want to live with us even though they're physically not there. 
where they should be. Uh, I think that should be where exactly they should be. Where should they be uh, located, situated? I think uh, you know that's a that's a very important question for for us. No, I think uh, Sushi, unmute, please. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. No, as I said, statues may be easier to deal with, but when it comes to monuments, like, um, I want both your views on Central Vista. How can a government just take a decision? How does one now create a public uh, awareness about this? How does it one do without um, instilling a sense of heritage and why this should be done with a lot of consultation, as like um, Professor Menon said, with town planners, not you know just government uh, employed engineers taking decisions. How do we resolve issues like this? We can't take it. There can't be long-term solutions. This has to be here and now. When this government is here, something needs has to be done. How do we do that? Well, all I have to say is that one of the things that INTAC uh, Chennai chapter is doing is to increase public awareness. Obviously, that's a very strong and strategic move. The public must be aware of the fact that these are not decisions made behind closed doors or behind uh, you know, professional walls. These are public decisions, and they have to be involved. And the only way they can be involved is in uh, events like that you are trying to run, you know, to make pe more people aware of the complexities of the issues. So the Central Vista, you'll have both sides. Some people say you've got to redevelop it. Some people say you've got, uh, you, you don't have to do it. Other people say do it this way. Other people, another person says do it a third way. But basically, it comes down to the fact that you've got to consult. You've got to make it transparent. You've got to make it much more democratic. So I think that's the way forward. So we got to retrieve a democracy. So the Central Vista uh, uh, project, as far as uh, the lesson I learned from that is, of course, there are a lot of things that have gone wrong with conservation, but a lot of things have gone wrong with our governance. Means if we cannot democratically decide public places, then why are we discussing the nuances of conservation? Who is it for? For ourselves only then, not for the public, because the public is not involved. So if you really mean that it has to be a public discussion, there has to be negotiated decision-making, a lot of points of views have been uh, brought in, and that takes time. It's not going to be done today. The Central Redevelopment Project should have been done 20 years ago, they should have started to make a talk. And then maybe today something could have been worked out what to be done. But instead, what happens is that a government comes for five years, and they say, well, in five years, we're going to do it. And that's exactly what's happened here. In 2019, the government decided that we'll do it. It has to be done by 2024. My God, it's unimaginable. It violates not only protocols of conservation, it violates protocols of governance, it, protocol, it violates protocols of, of uh, democracy, it violates everything that is, uh, we hold here. So that's Central Vista. And I'm glad that you're bringing it out in the open here for discussion. We should have many more such discussions. So, Professor Bhatwa, what do you feel about it? No, I, I, you know, let's take another example of, uh, yeah. of conflicted heritage. Uh, I mean, I mentioned, uh, I mean, we, we have also mentioned the, the, the Cordoba Mosque Cathedral. Uh, I remember my a friend, of, a Turkish friend of mine, telling me uh, some time back that in 2010, a person who had converted uh, recently to Islam, he came to the cathedral or the mosque cathedral, and he wanted to pray inside. And in fact, what he what he what he was uh, he was of course not allowed to do that. But he then uh, got his rug out and prayed outside the cathedral. What he wanted to do was something that happens in some ways in the uh, in the uh, what is it uh, the Church of the Holy 
sepulcher in, in Jerusalem, which is that the same uh, monument can be used by Hindu, uh, sorry, by, by three different uh, 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 sects of uh, Christianity that happens in Jerusalem. He wanted in the, in the, in the mosque, uh, that mosque cathedral, the same thing. He wanted Muslims and Christians to pray together inside the mosque. And in fact, he actually tried to persuade his prime minister in, in Spain. He wanted to persuade his prime minister to write to uh, the Turkish uh, uh, president that they should also try to make, because there was already uh, a lot of uh, movement to turn it into a mosque, uh, and he wanted the mosque, uh, he wanted Hagia Sophia to be turned into a place which can be used not only as a museum, but also as a place where both Muslims and uh, 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 people who follow is not is an Orthodox Christian uh, Orthodox Church, they could all go and, and pray there. So I think we have imaginative solutions like that. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid this is this, neither of the, I mean, the, the governments didn't agree to it, and, and the two religions uh, didn't agree. I mean, people, spokesperson of the two religions didn't agree to it. But it is not as if this has not happened in the past. Uh, this was, uh, this happened even during the wars of religion. When one, uh, uh, when the Protestants tried to displace uh, Catholicism in some uh, areas in, in, in Western Europe, uh, they, of course, it was, you know, there was a lot of extermination, expulsion, but in, in smaller sites where people tolerated each other, they shared the place of in their own ways. Uh, so I think uh, these are imaginative solutions that we can think of. Uh, when it comes to uh, monuments which have a conflicted history uh, and uh, which seems like, you know, an impossible to resolve, but, you know, ordinary people come up with important, you know, such solutions. And I think uh, we have a practice in India. I mean, uh, all our shrines are visited by Hindus and Muslims alike. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think that this is a practice that we can encourage even in places which are disputed. So I don't know whether that will, I mean, this is only a, maybe it's just a dream at the moment, but I think if, if we had dreamt like that about 30, 40 years ago, I think we would have succeeded in realizing it. We just missed that opportunity. Uh, well, I don't think we did because we did dream it. Our, our constitution did dream it. Yes. Now our constitution is being hijacked. That's, yes, I, that, it's been happening for 40 years now. Yes. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, we, 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 a lot of people are to blame here. It's not just one uh, section. Uh, if, I think uh, many things which should have been done in the 60s and 70s were not done. And we are facing the consequence of that now. Um, Professor Benham, before we open this to questions, you were actually talking about this is a strange situation in this country that the majority is feeling aggrieved more than the minority. Yeah. So when did this transition happen? It's been happening for 2,000 years. It's been transition to take its place. I think the majority has unfortunately kept the minority completely invisible. And that has continued. So, you know, uh, I'm afraid the, our whole idea of culture, our whole idea of civilization is a majoritarian point of view. And when we say those have to be conserved, we still have not come to terms with 2,000 years of a conflicted history. So, yes, uh, it has to be done. I think it should be done. If you are civilized people, as we claim, we've got to dig in some point. And, we, this, this is a, and I, I sort of enjoyed this discussion because when you asked for it, I said, yes, here's an opportunity to reflect on how to do it. When you suddenly realize that your history is conflicted and this is a of the heritage, how do you conserve it? You know, the tail begins to drag the dog. So we will be talking about the tail. 
but you know we are really talking about a much larger issue in our country so thank yeah. you for asking the question yeah so yeah uh, okay i i just that yeah i would sort of i slightly disagree that this has been happening for 2000 years i think this is a a 300 years problem okay. Okay. Uh, it's not a, i wouldn't go that far back okay. i think uh, i mean in there are many parts of india i mean for example the vedic uh, vedic uh, 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 brahmanical religion if you might call it that I mean, they they didn't even believe in temples. I mean, uh, leave alone having statues in temples. Yeah. They all that they did was to uh, have a temporary sacred space where they had their ritual. And once the ritual was over, that place was gone, and that sacredness was gone with it. So, uh, so it isn't. I mean, uh, this idea of uh, having. I mean, I don't know when they. I mean, the, the Buddhists and the Jains were the first. To have uh, statues, uh, uh, the, the the so-called you know the, the the Brahmins, they were not even interested in building statues. Yeah. So uh, so uh, I'm not surprised that there are in many parts of India there are not as many temples as I mean some temples have been destroyed. There's no denying that. But I mean the fact that we are not uh, we don't have uh, 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 an overcrowded Temple space till 30 years ago. Uh, now suddenly temples have grown everywhere. So I don't think uh, uh, this is this is uh, not a major issue. Uh, uh, 300, 400 years. Ago. I think we, we, we these are new conflicts uh, which began really in the 18th century. Uh, it's uh, the Babri Masjid thing is very disputable. I have, I really don't know uh, whether whether we we have ev evidence of. I mean, that that itself became disputed only about 150 years ago. Yes, I don't know. So I think uh, we we have an ancient reservoir of practices which are deeply uh, inclusive and tolerant uh, of one another. Uh, we had other forms of intolerances, and I and actually that relates me to the other point. I think we have a parallel uh, to to a majority not sympathizing with the minority uh, in another sense, and that is the Dalit question. Yes, I think that's where the history of I mean that's a history of slavery in some ways. But that's what uh, I was referring to, yeah, really. That's what I was referring to. Yeah, I mean, we have, we don't, I mean, the Hindu Muslim or the, or the Hindu Christian issue, this is much more. But if we have 2,000 years of, 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 a, of a problem, then. Yeah. Well, it's, and I think uh, that's the issue that we have to address. Where are those of uh, heritage uh, which the Dalits claim? And claim as their own. I mean, where are the, it's not as if they didn't have their gods and images. They've all been either appropriated and they've become Brahmanized, yes, or they are, you know, or or they're forgotten. And still remember, we 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 we, we don't see them around. We, we they're no they're no public expression, and I think so. A lot of work has to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. They were not even allowed inside temples till about, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of uh, 20th century, early 20th century. So question of Dalit monuments, are they there? I mean, do we have any historical reference to them? Do we? Well, you know, I think that's a, a, a sort of a very uh, uh, complex question to ask. For example, we often think that Africa didn't have a history. We, for example, think that the Aboriginal people did not have a history. And I think they had a different kind of history, a different kind of monument, different kind of heritage. I think those are things that we're going to learn. For example, when the Bharachata came in Australia, there were the monuments. But yet they said that there was an Aboriginal culture that had to be respected, conserved, and celebrated. And they went about doing it. 
So I think when we talk about heritage and monuments and conservation, there's a linearity that is extremely majoritarian. There could be other narratives. There could be other ways of looking at heritage. There are other ways of celebrating the past. Um, I, I just would like to ask, are we getting more and more majoritarian now? All over the world, yeah. I think that that's a sort of a, a, a political economy is leading towards it. And I think all over the world, we're finding that, whether it's Turkey or Philippines or India or China or anywhere in America, where the, what is Trump? What is Boris Johnson? You know, these are all things that in one form or the other are uh, examples of a, a very minor majoritarian point of view, a, a minority view that is majoritarian. They are uh, extremely exclusive views, not inclusive views. Dr. Bhagwa, what do you think? How do we fight this majoritarianism? When the philosophy is tending oh, toward... <laughs> Um, I think uh, we really have to, I mean, in, in the Indian context, I think uh, we, there are, I could say just two things. One is that we are fortunate to have, uh, and if only showed our faith and fought for it when they come. Uh, I think we will will we can get back to that. The other thing, of, I mean, and this is the point that uh, uh, Professor Menon raised uh, about Eurocentric uh, we have been. I think, I think we, I think we really need. My order. I think we we this uh, decolonization is a long process, uh, and I think uh, we are nowhere uh, nowhere uh, near. I think uh, uh, reaching the end of it. As a matter of fact, that new form of decolonization of the mind, which arose immediately after our political independence. So I think uh, I think we need to examine that much more carefully, and look at a bit the. Look, not many of our practices through the prism of Eurocentric categories. Once we begin to do that, I think we will be able to excavate them and, and learn more than uh, uh, we have done so far. I mean, the, the, this whole majoritarian business is, uh, is frankly, uh, a European. Uh, this is part of the European discourse. The, our whole understanding of our religion is because we have borrowed the entire category of religion and imposed on the way that we related to our gods and goddesses, uh, the way we construct our own traditions of faith. And so, I think if, if once you if you, if you start looking at religion as as doctrinal. Uh, and, and, and as uh, with, uh, which are which are with bounded communities, which are rivals of each other because they're fighting for uh, the the, the uh, uh, for, for converting uh, one or the other person to their faith. I think if once you begin to do that, then you have a lot of problems that we do. I don't think uh, we we had that. I mean, there was some sections uh, and some phases in India where, where we did this counter forces which did uh, oh uh, which didn't allow uh, uh, these uh, these kind of uh, what now we don't get closest to them there there, there are there there is a this uh, past that India uh, started in both it and it. Right? But the Constitution actually tried to capture some of that. It has modernized some things and it has tried to keep the spirit of 
that pluralism uh, alive. Uh, and, and, and I think if we, if, if, if we are able to do that, we uh, taking our democracy seriously and not reducing it to uh, mere electoral uh, democracy. Uh, and if we uh, are, uh, uh, if we have our faith in our constitution, I think that's the way to go forward, really. I mean, it's very hard, uh, particularly in these times, to think like that. But I mean, what what option do we have? Uh, I mean, we have to look at whatever the straws are uh, put onto them, and 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 I would say that these are these things are absolutely necessary. And this is and conservation. It's it, these are. This is part of a much uh, a broader issue and uh, struggle. Uh, so, yeah. This is why I find that conservation is a very important discipline because it it tackles not only the the problem of the history but the problem of everything else that we are today. And uh, how we conserve becomes an issue that. Uh, has an implication much more than what the monument uh, uh, we are focusing on. So today's discussion, really, I want to sort of stress the point that we are talking about issues that are far more than removing of statues or Hagia Sophia or Central Vista. It has to do with a much larger uh, perspective of ourselves, our society, of our nation, of our civilization, of our culture, etc. So that is why negotiation is important, inclusion, inclusion is important, and the process is extremely important. If you can't stress process at all in, to make any kind of decision, you know, we're back to majoritarianism. Who decides becomes the person who makes the decision. And we've got to accept the fact, no, to include everyone else, we've got to discuss and discuss. In fact, I recall one of the uh, 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 rationale for the Central Vista is that the architect says, Oh, if you consulted the people, we'd never do this project. My God, that would have been the solution. But the architect still sincerely believes that had he not actually put his foot down and said, do this, do this, do this, the project would not have happened. And one can only say that disaster happened because of that. So that's one reading of Central Vista. So we have to learn to be more inclusive and... Uh... Professor Menon, as you said, we have to have, you have to push this local charter. Yes. Like they did in Japan and Australia. And yes. So. But you know, uh -huh. the complexity is that, again, all this, if you take the conservation profession, because I'm fairly involved in the conservation profession, if I talk to the colleagues, the idea of modernity dominates. They want to be as modern as the Europeans, as modern as the rest of the world. And so they denigrate what we have, our, our past. So, so that is a, a, a problem also, isn't it? That's where this thing about majoritarianism comes. That, that's what Professor Balgo was saying, this Eurocentricism, that we are somehow captured in that, uh, that uh, worldview that we've got to be as good as anyone else. We can't be as good as we are, but we we are. Be good as, yeah, we've got to be good as someone else. Our cities have to be world class. Our, you know, our conservation has to be like what Europe does, etc. So, you know, these are issues that uh, I hope a session like this begins to question and people go back with some kind of a doubt in their mind that maybe they're going to rethink this entire uh, conservation uh, process and narrative. Thank you. Okay, do we thank have, you. Do we have some to, time uh, to I also questions? wanted to... Sorry? I just wanted to add. Uh, uh, can I just add a thing? Yes, please. No, all, all I, I think uh, uh, displacing Europe well, from yeah. the center yeah. Yeah. is not the same as ignoring and stop, stopping ourselves from learning from it. Mm. Uh, I think what we need is decentering Europe, which is, uh, I mean, we, I don't think that 
it follows from an attack on Eurocentrism that now we should become nativist. I think the what we have to fight for is an equality of of uh, peoples all over the world, uh, where each uh, culture of even if you want to use the civilization, each civilization has a voice. I'm sure uh, 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 there was many with me that uh, none of us, neither of us, was actually uh, advocating that we have a new kind of independence. No, 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 uh, no. But, uh, yes. With one, yeah. one caveat, uh, Raj, Raj, one caveat. Modernity, we have to be modern because we're today living today and we've got face today's problems. And we're going to invent the solutions for today. But the point is, which solutions do we adopt? The trend has been to adopt solutions that others have invented. Whereas in conservation, in architecture, in city planning, it is so rooted in culture that the modernity has to come from the culture. So it's not nativism so much as the fine, as what one, one would call indigenous modernity. It has to be modern, but it has to be rooted in a certain uh, uh, roots that reflect our uh, ourselves. So there's that thing, it's sort of a fine line between nativism and indigenous modernity uh, has to be made. Otherwise, we throw the baby with the bathwater saying that no, 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 don't look at anything indigenous. Look at something that is uh, uh, modern. Modern means, again, I won't use the word Eurocentric, but it tends to be values that were developed by Eurocentricism, which becomes a problem. And if you're a conservationist and you try and say that, look, I want to conserve this ruin as a ruin, the person, the local population will look at you aghast and say, look, that's not conservation. Conservation should rebuild this building. I want this temple again. I want to worship on it in this place again. But a, a conservationist trained in the uh, Eurocentric point of view will say that no, conservation is preserving history as we've inherited it. So you see, we get into these profound issues uh, that are much deeper than the uh, the, uh, the object that we're discussing. Sushila? Sushi, please unmute yourself. Sushi, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. No, I said this, this is such a complex issue that if I throw more questions at you, we can discuss <laughs> this for hours to come because yes. In a complex country like India, each region thinks differently what to preserve and not to preserve. As you know, in Tamil Nadu and Chennai, we just put up statues and pull them down and, you know, maybe every week. So, um, Sujata, do we have time for questions? Maybe just... Sujata, are there, yeah, maybe one or two. Yeah, just a couple of questions and Pat can do the summing up, please. Yeah. Hmm. Can you post the questions? I ask the audience if he wants to ask the question. Yeah. If please of, stay. If anybody would like to ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. To see if there are no are we able to get questions? I can't see any. No. I think if if there are no questions, you can ask Tara to see. No, Okay.
So as we are not getting any questions, Sarah, may I ask you to sum up this session? Thank you. Give your concluding remarks. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sushi. Um, before I thank the speakers, Professor A.G.K. Menon and Professor Rajiv Bhargava, and also the moderator, Ms. Sushila Ravindranath, I would just like to say four things about evaluating and conserving built heritage that has limited <coughs> our perspective on the past. Um, I'm, uh, this has come out, all these, what I'm going to say, I have written it earlier, but <coughs> both of you have expressed it in the course of the talk. So for cogency, let me just uh, read out what I have written. The first thing is, built heritage is not merely the name of the ruler who built it and the use it was put to. It reflects the society of the time, the skills and 